the football they play, the collective harmony, the idea of it, the domination, the mindset, the utter, the utter pulverizing force. Manchester City under Pep Guardiola, they're an art form, right, David? Yeah, and just think about when Haaland reaches the levels of, I don't know, like Darwin Nunez. I mean, it's going to be, it's going to be amazing to watch <laughs> when it gets that good. From the Men in Blazers studios in the crap part of Bedford and the crap part of Long Island, New York, it's the Men in Blazers video podcast presented by the GFOPs at Camarena, the most awarded tequila. We back. Oh, like my mate Duncan Robinson. How are you doing, Dave? Oh, good. Great weekend. I know you enjoyed the PGA Golf, the performance of Michael Block. What a story. Club professional from Southern California. Oh, just warms the hearts of millions. It was beautiful. It's a Dwight McNeil of golf, but this is <laughs> our first part. I mean that in a nice way. Oh, really? Is that the first time you've used Dwight McNeil in a nice way in your life? Yeah. I used his nickname Dwight as opposed to his given name Shite, but... <laughs> This is our first part, and we have to deal with the serious news up top since, really, American history, the American nation, um, was forever changed. Um, We got ourselves the next top American striker, Davo. Yeah, I mean, we hope so. We hope so. Falaren uh, Balogun comes in just scoring for fun in the French Ligue 1. Daddy Uh, wants. And... um, uh, yeah, he's he's there. Our nation, let's put this into context, who scored all of three goals total in the entirety of the last World Cup. One a good one, one off uh, off Pulisic's ball bag, yeah. and one a total fluke. Um, now have following Balagan riding with us. <laughs> and if the name is new to you, I'm shocked because it's been headlined. So it was in my New York Times front page above the fold. The 21-year-old Brooklyn-born Arsenal-bred striker on loan this season at Rem, where he's really just had a breakout season. At the weekend, he scored his 20th goal of the season and became the first US men's national team player in history on nation's history to net 20 goals in the top five league. God bless you, Flo, who tweeted yesterday. I love this. I really did. This gave me so much bloody pleasure. Today, I became the first American player in history. I love this so much to score 20 or more goals in a top five league. Without my teammates, this wouldn't be possible. And I know Jesus Ferrer is listening and and no doubt you don't have to tweet us, Jesus. We know you're smiling through this, but I I read that and was like, I can't get enough. As a a newly made American, I can't get enough uh, of following use of the word American here. We are lucky to have Balagon ride with us. And I've talked a lot last week on YouTube um, in the reaction video that I made and on on at least two podcasts, I think, about this news, following Balogun, who could have played for England, could have played for Nigeria, but committed to play with the United States ahead of the World Cup on home turf here in 2026, which I think is is quite a draw. But what do you make of it, David? I mean, look, I'm not going to... I don't want to pour cold water on this because I do think it is significant. I think it's significant for a number of reasons. He obviously is the best possible striker I would say available to play for the US and that's who they've got but you know we do tend to crown US players before they've quite achieved what they need to achieve for the team that we're actually crowning them for he has to put on a US shirt he has to score goals in a US shirt and Liga is definitely impressive but you know Jonathan David Scores plenty of goals in that league. I think maybe even more than Flora and Balogun. Uh, Lacazette, who I don't think many Arsenal fans were sad to see leave Arsenal, has scored more goals in Ligue 1. There are other strikers. It's not like Habib Diallo of Senegal. We're thinking, oh, like Senegal have got Diallo. This is a huge move. Has scored By the way, goals. let me just step in here because I know Diallo listens to the podcast. <laughs> if you are interested, if you're America <laughs> curious, Diallo. So, type of word. DM so, me. so yes, it's a big story. But let's let's allow a player to actually do it in a US shirt, and then let's all get behind him. What? So, that's my. That's, that's surely my the wrong way around. Hype trains don't leave the station like that, Davo. But you know, I, I I agree and I don't agree. You know, I, I've got to say, big picture in context, top line, it feels so bloody good to have great news 
positive news, joyous news emanating from our US men's national team after, you know, the leadership conference um, of doom that we've been really just <laughs> bearish by. Did I uh, miss a leadership conference in the middle of there? I'm sorry. I might yeah, that's the one. funny thing about Balogun. He didn't even announce it at a leadership <laughs> wow. conference. And I found it really odd. I mean, Balogun, in this country, we go we go off the record at leadership conferences yeah. on the record. That's how we do it. But you know, he is a super capable striker. Make no mistake. Number two, in a position that cries out on the US for a massive, massive upgrade. Balogun is a very good footballer right now. But, you know, I think, as you're hinting, so raw still. So, so much upside, we pray to come. I think that's the the way to frame it. And, you know, yes, Arsenal are probably going to deal him. It'll be fascinating to see where he ends up uh, over the summer. Um, and he's not a messiah. That, 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 that. We have to we have to acknowledge you in in the YouTube instant reaction video that I taped. I did talk about, um, and I've got to say I can't wait to speak to Balogun because his story is amazing. Um, I, I love his confidence too. I love I love how much being wanted both by the US players who made that very clear on social media and the US fan base made him ride with us. But on the on the YouTube instant reaction video that I taped, you know, I, I, we have to be self-aware as United States fans. And by the way, as I say that, I'm completely aware. Um, <laughs> that you're that, almost the worst offender. <laughs> well, that, yes, true, true. But, you know, to, I say uh, we United States fans and we dream so big, we've suffered so much. It's been a long time in the wilderness. Saying that we US fans should be self-aware is like me saying, you know, I should get a new haircut. <laughs> Maybe we just are the way we are. But we do dream so big. We do tend to ricochet between... Roughly, would you say two settings, Davo? Like a self-destructive, wallowing and utter sheer despair. And the other mood we have is win it all, you know, way out of reality, overconfidence. Um, give us the trophies now. Is that fair to say those are our two general moods? Yeah, these are two settings. I've got a name for both of them. And weirdly, the name is exactly the same. And that name is Rog. It applies to both. It's fair. It's fair. I do try and be a bit more nuanced here. And I will say, (laughs) we always want that silver bullet to flick the switch from from gloom to glory. That that, that, that silver bullet has a name. Its name is Breckshay. And, you know, (laughs) we've got to admit, football, like life, does not work like that. You only need to look at the career arcs of of Pulisic, um, of Gio, of Tyler, of Weston currently Serginho Dest, where we've seen soaring ups, incredible moments and true moments of challenge. Nothing is straight line. And I say that, as I say, let's welcome, follow him. Let's savor the prospect of him playing against Mexico June the 15th. That is a date to pencil. Um, But I do believe the decision over who will be our next manager, which should be imminent, is a real news to obsess about. Yeah, I feel like that decision has already been made. Um, it just hasn't been announced yet. No, it's great news. It's Sam and- Allardyce has got to finish his, his four games at least. First. <laughs> yeah. And I would say that like lots of England fans uh, make the point, which is legitimate, that um, you know England can't guarantee a guy a place in their starting 11, let alone their squad, um, because they've got so many strikers available to them who have to compete to go and get it. And yet, I still do admit, as an England fan, it would be nice to have selected him. And I think any England fan who says otherwise is uh, not telling the truth. Oh, come on, come on, follow in. USA, USA, USA. And England. Okay, before we get to the football, a quick word from Men in Blazers World Headquarters, where in the words of every Bundesliga fan's third or fourth favourite band, Journey, the wheel in the sky keeps on turning. <laughs> we don't know where we'll be tomorrow. Rog, we've got pods dropping every day from now through Memorial Day weekend, including Becky Sabrin's Road to the Cup, an incredible conversation with the captain of the U.S. Women's National Team and talking of conversations with sagacious U.S. players. Wednesday, it's a championship playoff pod special with none other special than special. your mate, Tim Ream, presented by ESPN+. Plus. Oh, that's right, Dave. We're ahead of Saturday's clash between Coventry and Luton. We're going to preview the game. We're going to get to spend some time with Tim, beautiful bloke, who has actually played in the championship playoffs. That strange, surreal, kind of the most American game um, in British football. He's played in it three times. And he's going to talk about 
this the, the singular experience of this football winner take all sword fight a preview podcast with an american premier league hero designed to tell you everything you need to know about saturday's clash and talking of great americans this weekend a very special episode of the men in blazers tv show on peacock for which you traveled up to the nbc studios in stamford connecticut to hang with rebecca lua and robbie earl and present the first ever men in blazers american football awards presented by bud light and am I reading this correctly? It is our season nine finale. You are reading that right, Dave. Capping off the ninth season. By the way, we never take it for granted that we're able to do this um, in this moment of time in the United States. The, the Men in Blazers is going to celebrate this moment. Uh, by launching these awards with you, dear listeners, the Men in Blazers American Football Awards, in which we present the American Premier League Player of the Year and the American American Premier League Player of the Year as voted on by you, dear GFOPs. It's a magical half hour um, in which I got to elude security briefly. They did find me on set and evict me halfway through the show. But I got to spend time with Bex and the Robbie suspense. Which Robbie to reflect on this remarkable season? Um, and right now, the TV show, uh, we are taping this week acceptance speeches from both winners who received their respective awards. We will be launching the women's version of these later in the year at the end of the NWSL season and the Women's World Cup. Uh, but the prize for all of these awards may or may not be an enormous WWE style giant belt. Oh, sorry, Roger. I think I might have revealed which Robbie during my intro. It all goes down <laughs> this Sunday on Peacock, where you can watch every episode of the Men in Blazer show from the last two seasons. Rog, can we start this pod with a twist? Oh, I want to raise my third thirst Bud Light of the day to Vinicius Jr., that 22-year-old wonderkin at Real Madrid who's thrilled us all season with his football. Uh, but this weekend, in the most terrible scenes, um, has ended up confronting the racism in La Liga and the entirety of Spain after he was racially abused from the stands throughout Real's 1-0 defeat at Valencia on Sunday. And during the game, the Brazilian attempted to point out to the referee the fans who behind the goal were racially abusing him. The ref ignored him. Um, and by the end of the game, he'd been red carded and cast as a villain after wrestling with an opponent who charged at and choked him. And we've got to say, in context, Vinny has been a magnet for racism in Spain. Um, he tweeted after the game, it was not the first time, nor the second, nor the third. Racism is normal in La Liga. The competition considers it normal. The federation considers it normal. And the rivals encourage it. These are hard words to read. The championship, he wrote, that once belonged to Ronaldinho, to Ronaldo, to Cristiano and Messi. Today belongs to the racists. And I've got to credit Real Madrid's manager, Carlo Ancelotti, what an incredible human being he is, who instantly stepped in to speak up nobly. Um, and I think importantly about the dire state of the Spanish game, this is unacceptable. La Liga has a problem, he said. But La Liga's chief executive, Javier Tabas, then engaged in an ill-advised back and forth with Vinny Jr. on Twitter, in which he stood by his league's attempts to tackle racism and scoldingly tried to mansplain to Vinicius um, about the whole incident. Really a terrible look. I'll just say the outpouring of support for Vinicius Jr. shows where the right side of history lies. And Mbappe, even Brazilian president Lula, stepped in to support him. And we've always said... Football is just a mirror that reflects the politics, the culture of the society that surrounds it. In this case, the darkness of all of that. And to Vinicius, we wish you strength and love and to better days ahead for all. Yeah, I think he handled himself beautifully, Roger, in the toughest, toughest situation. Uh, okay, to the football and the Premier League title race that has been run. And it ended not with a bang, but with a Taiwo and Wonyi goal this weekend. A goal that saw Nottingham Forest claim a massive 1-0 win over Arsenal this Saturday. And because Arsenal lost, it meant that Man City had secured their third straight Premier League title without having to kick a ball. Let's go back to the beginning and relive it all, Rog, starting on the banks of the River Trent with still not entirely safe from relegation Nottingham Forest, taking on an Arsenal team whose title challenge was on life support. Magnificent scenes before the game, the pomp of the Nottingham Forest fans, the belief, the vibe, the immense passionate support, which more than anything has given this team left for dead at least twice this season. 
It's given them life. 30 points from 19 home games. Nottingham Forest, just a paltry seven from the 18 so far on the road. And with that supreme motivation behind them from the off, Forest smashed into the Gunners, who were uncalibrated and out of position with Xhaka filling in at fullback and White looking out of whack in the middle. Morgan Gibbs White, a player who sounds most likely to have come from the Arsenal Academy who never went there, blew Arsenal apart. And it really had to be Awoni, the gent who'd scored so many important goals down the stretch, two in the 4-3 win over Southampton, two against Chelsea. Um, and on the run here with Gabriel trying to mop up, Awoni stuck out his leg, the ball bobbled off Gabriel and into the goal. A slight fortune about it, uh, but Ramsdale rooted to his line was helpless. Ten Premier League goals now on the season uh, for Wony. Massive goals, it needs to be said. Game winners, point winners. Most Premier League goals since the start of May. Five for Taiwo, four for Ilkay Gundogan. That is enormous. A, a Wony is essentially Forrest Witcharlison, or what he was to Everton. Last season, Forrest, reach out for safety! Bellow Peter Drury, we are staying up, bellowed the Forrest fans. Um, but it was probably the City fans who were most delirious in that minute, right, David? Yeah, I mean, Pep had said before the game that he he would rather uh, Arsenal, um, you know, get the win and City would have to, you know, have something to play for in front of their home fans um, on Sunday, but I don't imagine many Man City fans felt that. I mean, you just want to get over the line. You want to go and win the title, and uh, you know, and as evidenced by the crowds that turned out for the uh, for the bus making its way to the Etihad um, on Sunday, um, I think this was very, very welcome for those uh, sky blue fans. Oh, Arsenal tried to up their urgency. Remember, they beaten Forest five nil in the reverse fixture. Um, and they did have all the possession, but they had none of the intelligence that we associate and have come to admire from them this season. The Forest fans gave their players all the energy they needed to replenish. Arsenal just, they just looked frustrated. They looked shattered, honestly. Kept thinking of that Blur song, No Distance Left to Run. Um, it's hard to love in life, dear listeners, when you've got a broken heart. And I think it's hard to play winning football when Manchester City have, have shattered and broken you. Is, is, that the, is that the conclusion you can take from this? Yeah, I mean, it's tough to play and it's tough to compete when you've already lost. And yet, I imagine that Mikel Arteta is trying to get the completely opposite reaction from his squad. You know, the narrative of, oh, we just got pipped by Manchester City for the title is sort of going out of the window. This looks like the league is going to be won by nine, maybe 10 points by the time we're said and done, which isn't, it's not a squeaker. They have been way squeakier uh, Premier League titles over the last few years. So, yeah, I think it's disappointing the way they've performed in the last few weeks. And I think particularly on Saturday, this was a disappointing performance. Yeah, I mean, really, we can talk about this tale of this conclusion of a season left for dead. Um, but we've got to credit man, we've got to credit Nottingham Forest who Fantastic. have managed to harvest ten points from the last five games. Uh, it should also be said um, in that period for Arsenal. I think they've they've taken just six from the same. Uh, spell a Newcastle duel. Remember that one? That seemed to be just a bug, a detour, misdirection amidst the claps. Um, and Forrest, what an atmosphere. What a fan base. Steve Cooper, been on the brink of being fired in his Paul Smith gear at least three times. He's looked death in the eye and said, not today. Um, he's built a squad, Dave. Incredible. <laughs> Out of so many pieces of flotsam and jets and washed up. How, I just imagine so many Hello My Name badges that he's trying to organise into tactical charts. Yeah. Incredible. Also incredible, Dave. Um, and that approach, by the way, does not empower long-time sanity at Forest. Incredible. This season, Fulham safe, Bournemouth safe, now Forest safe for the first time since 2017-18, just a fourth time ever. All the newly promoted clubs stay up. When you said Steve Cooper looks death in the eye, um, death is in the eye of Greek Todd Burley, Rog, a man that we have not discussed enough, Evangelos, Evangelos Maranakis. Yes, the wonderful, astute uh, Greek owner. And every time they cut to him in the stands, he seemed to be combing either his moustache <clears throat> or his beard, which I think was a great look. 
Yeah, I think they come from the same, uh, uh, like a river comes from a source. I think the beard and the mustache both have the same. Mr. Source. He's, he's a <laughs> remarkable man. Yeah. He is a remarkable man. I can just imagine him singing in a very deep voice in some a cappella group. When I just imagine him being like, oh, 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 just constantly just bring it. He looks like one of the three tenors who's decided yeah. to sod singing and get into the football game. He's a proper terrifying human being. But I am Will Marsh tweeted us, folks, I haven't seen a forest this relieved. Since the Amazon, when Lula was re-elected in Brazil, <laughs> we've got to talk quickly about Arsenal before we get to City. David, the bottle job narrative emanating out of every English tabloid, it's now going to pick up steam. You know, this is a team that led the Premier League for 248 days this season, most ever for a team that failed to win the, the, the title in, in English top flight history. Um, this squad out of energy. January 1st, I'm old enough to remember tweets like, never has a Premier League club with as many points as Arsenal at this stage of the season. 43, not gone on to win the league. But it's ended with a limp series of performances. Sean, of all the strengths, everything we marveled at, the creativity, the intelligence, the confidence, the collective belief um, that we've just, we've just bowed down to. Seven weeks ago, Arsenal were eight points clear. Um, I, I feel for that. I, I don't believe in the bottle job narrative. I do believe this is just a squad too thin, uh, ultimately down the stretch, mentally, physically. Um, but you do end up with the aftertaste of disappointment. Speaking to Arsenal fans in my life, you know, it sounds like they've just had an incredible meal at one of the best restaurants in the world uh, and then been forced to eat a dog turd for dessert. That feeling, that dog turd breath is now the stain. Um, it covers over all the joy. It's the hangover that goes into the transfer window, the negative, David, the weaknesses rather than the strengths that will be, I fear, the memory that clouds the postseason. I think the defence to the bottle job from Arsenal fans is that, wait a minute, we're learning so much from this season. You just wait and wait to see who we are next season and what we've learned from it. And I think also that's where we have to defer our judgment of what's happened that we've got to see if that defence is accurate. And I think if Arsenal do bounce back next year and get even stronger, we can say this was an important lesson learned. This is a young squad that have, um, that have you know, probably a little slightly thin squad, not quite enough depth. They need a bit more help in the off-season and this is how they get to the next place. If they don't do this, if they don't manage to bounce back, if they don't get stronger, if next season is not as strong for them, then... You know, I think you've got to revisit it and say, yeah, you know what? This was their chance to go and win it last season. This is where they had the chance. And wow, I bet they wish they had another chance like this again. This is the most important conversation right now for Arsenal fans. Summer investment. Who comes in? You know, that bench looked so thin yesterday. Vieira, I'd say arguably a mistake. Tierney, I love that man. Uh, I love his just the fierceness. Uh, seems to have lost his way at the club. Emile Smith-Rowe, really a lost boy. Um, Arteta needs options. Um, and the rumour mill now links them to, this morning, Declan Rice, Mason Mount, even intriguingly, Hilkai Gundogan. But the only one in coming this weekend was a chocolate Labrador named Wynn. <laughs> Um, Arteta is brought to live. Do you see this story in the Gunners training yeah. facility to quote, show love and develop a family atmosphere at the club. Emotional support dogs are the best. David, don't you think they might need more than one? Though? Yeah, I think we've got to check the uh, Premier League handbook and see if the uh, chocolate lab is available to play um, to sort of, you know, back, back at back everybody up in, in multiple phases of the field or if he's just there on frisbee catching duty we have no idea I think that's the difference right there between Arteta and Pep Arteta's like my players need comfort they need emotional support they're emotionally stunted they need a dog to pet and make them feel better about life Pep would bring in a dog but make it mate with Gunnosaurus and try and breed some, you know, maybe a Phil Foden, even better than Foden, could be bred if Wynn is forced to make love to the Saurus. He's been working on Gunnosaurus doodles. Yeah, we will have to see. Sorry. Certainly two very different managers with very different approaches to emotional oh. support dogs. I think we can agree broadly there. God, now I can't stop thinking about Gunnosaurus when he's in the mood. <laughs> <laughs> he might change colour. <laughs> oh my God, let's talk okay, about... Okay, Rog, so the, football. the next day, Sunday, fresh off working on a short game, Pep took a break from the golf course, headed over to the Etihad to see City defeat Chelsea... 1-0, felt like 10, in what was less a game of football and more a coronation. 
three-peat, just like the Chicago Bulls. And both of all that Abu Dhabi oil money. And, you know, I did think, I bet the schedulers, you know, pat themselves on the back when they developed the fixture list, David. They were just like, mm, we're saving this bond stormer for the end of the season, right? And little did they know it would have almost no meaning. Manchester City have been that dominant, that pulverizing. Uh, this non happy flowers team, eight points back just over a month ago. But that entire title chase was just making a fool out of all us. They, they were just so hungry. They were so ravenous down the stretch. And they walked out yesterday uh, to We Are the Champions, knowing that they'd already won a third title in three seasons through a guard of honour given by Chelsea. Poor Raheem Sterling, those feelings. Pat then walked out late, dressed head to toe in black. And the afraid to signal to, to all of us, really, that if he was a guest at Westworld, he'd be a black hat. And against Chelsea, feeble one win in their last 11 Chelsea, 12th place Chelsea, really serving little purpose uh, than to remind us that just spending obscene amounts of cash idiotically doesn't necessarily lead to glory. City rested all of their big guns, Edison, Diaz, Stones, Gundogan, Harlan, Grealish, Rodri, De Bruyne, Bernardo on the bench. Um, and Peter Drury said this game, um, with all of City's backups on the field, including Kelvin Phillips, ripped out of Leeds, but finally making his league debut for City, was a game without jeopardy. But Devo, hasn't City's whole season at times felt like a game without jeopardy? Yeah, um, certainly a lot of it has. And look, you do feel that for those City players... They are playing to get noticed. And, you know, Peter Drury brought up this point with Lee Dixon that um, and Graham Lasso that they are playing to get noticed by their manager. And you don't feel like their manager isn't focusing on every single action in the entire game. Phil Foden playing for, you know, a place in the FA Cup starting lineup, playing for a place in the Champions League starting lineup. All over the field, there are players playing to get noticed and, and playing for that. And you would think on the other side, the Chelsea players would be playing perhaps to increase their value to the parent club or to a future club that they may go to. And it was really, you know, quite striking. I, I've rarely seen a game in which it was more striking that there were some players really, you know, making an effort, running after the ball, trying to do something, and other players doing almost nothing and just looking incredibly pissed off the entire time. It's not clear to me all the Chelsea players are wearing shin pads, Dave. I, I mean, <laughs> we should talk about the one. The one but why I'm just trade, just jogging yeah. around there. Well, the, the one goal, the flowing move. Palmer jumped on some slop. Fed Alvarez rifled home. 17th goal of the season for a footnote of a player. Magnificent footballer. Won the World Cup and now the Premier League in the same season. Uh, but so deep is that squad. Um, yeah, you know, City... City will splash the cash occasionally on the likes of Grealish, but it's a number of 40, 50 million dollar players they stockpile. Plus, it's got to be said, incredible recruitment, um, both in ability and the professional mindset that they bring. Plus the fact that when players do go wrong, like Phillips, there's just no pressure, no reverberation. Pep, who has won the 11 titles in 14 incredible working years as a manager, is in total control. He's never threatened um, in the same way as Chelsea barely threatened, six time in a run, City have kept them scoreless, all comps. Um, let's be honest, this game meant nothing. Um, it really warrants not a moment more of conversation, the game itself. But it should be noted, Chelsea, your Chelsea, will end in the bottom half of the table, worst finish in 27 years. I think the lowest number of points they've gleaned in the Premier League uh, era too. Do we, do we, we've talked about them a lot. It feels like a lot of repeat. I don't know if there is more to add. But I did want to say, you know, do you have anything new to add on this on this really lost season of folly? Nothing. I mean, the only thing to say is I think similar to what I said about Arsenal earlier, I think we have to we don't have to defer judgment on Chelsea. I think we can judge this season incredibly harshly and say this was really appalling at every level. Ownership, uh, management, players. You know, I don't want to criticise the backroom staff, but I imagine there were some... Sorry, man, why not? <laughs> Probably the people in catering did a horrible job horrible. in the executive suites. Horrible. I but, mean, condiments. Um, they have bloody condiments out. Ketchup. But, I mean, look, the thing for me is, is that Chelsea fans are like, oh, many are oh, just 
a raise this season, just like the season before Mourinho came back and won the league, the season we finished 10th. Like, it's all going to be fine. We're going to get everything sorted out. Mauricio's coming in. We'll get rid of some players, sell them for lots of money. I see potentially a darker off-season. I see a bunch of players who they aren't able to sell or have to sell either at such reduced rates or they have to subsidize their uh, their 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 incredibly bloated weekly paychecks in order to get them off the books. I see Maurizio Pochettino having a lot of the same problems that Lampard and Potter and Tuchel had with this uh, at this club. And I don't see an enormous amount other than the young players who are still, you know, coming through, you know, this young, fantastic young Italian player we have is uh, on loan at Reading scored this weekend at the under 20 world cup. And that was great. Like there's lots of good things coming up on the youth level and the women's team, what I can be incredibly optimistic about. But around this squad, I could see this continuing into next season and actually getting worse. Based on the form we've been in for the last half of this season, we'd be in the relegation battle. We actually, based on, on a current form table, we actually deserve to go down. Um, and it's a, I could see this getting worse before it gets better. I know that will seem like heresy to many Chelsea fans. But I'm just realistic. These are, there are some major issues. We may bounce back. It could just be that one man, Mauricio Pochettino, can come in and with less players we can do it. But I think that would be a tough ask to say that the underlying conditions all oh, go away. Poch is going to bring in Eric Dyer. He's going to bring in Deli Alley. It's going to be magnificent. <laughs> I mean, the, re- the reality is the one man you do have to obsess about really is Todd Burley. You know, there's these gentlemen, equity investors who know that they can invest sagely and they know the difference between investing and operating you're watching a gentleman try and operate everybody i speak to is just like he said not he's not an idiot in any stretch of the word but he's just having such a giddy great time being in the spotlight you know pressing that adrenaline buzz up of oh headlines when i buy a transfer that he keeps hitting that button over and over and over knowing he's just an investor and at football, knowing what you don't know, needing others to step in and operate, whether that occurs over this pause in the summer will determine the two different scenarios for your team. But I mean, it is stark. There's, there's huge amounts of money been spent on both clubs. And we have to say one so sagely, whatever you think about Manchester City, and we'll talk about that right now. Um, the huge amounts of money they spent have been spent with a clinicality, a strategy, a vision, a professionalism. Um, the you know uh, uh, David Conn, who was a lifelong Manchester City bo- fan, wrote a book, uh, Richer Than God, uh, about how you know his city, his ramshackle city, was taken over by Abu Dhabi. But even he, for everything he didn't like about the change, had to admire the ruthlessness, just the smarts that they put into that transformation. Chelsea is showing you that the opposite can be true. Huge money, just you know in a garbage can set on fire this season their learning will be fascinating but City won the title City deserve the conversation and the trophy celebration that followed third one in three seasons um, J-Dub's texting me City title pitch invasion almost becoming a yearly festival like Mardi Gras or Oktoberfest only with 100% more Oasis um, and the occasional Jack Grealish haircut and I did say Jack Grealish was to me the, the joy of the proceeding, so giddy. Gentleman was a bit part last season, talked about it, how he suffered with doubt. Um, he's been so resplendent this year. And to watch him as he walked down the line of all of City support staff, lifting so many into the air with just glee and calf muscle. Um, David, that man like LeBron, he's got a handshake for everyone. <laughs> yeah, he absolutely does. He's got that little personal relationship going everywhere. I just want to make one point, Roger, about what you were saying about the Abu Dhabi ownership is that this is a little bit different. This highlights the difference between the long-term ambitions of sovereign wealth ownership and the shorter-term ambitions of private equity ownership. You know, Clear Lake and Burley have come in in order to bring value to the club, shoot it up quickly and sell it to somebody else for more money. I don't think Abu Dhabi are ever going to sell the club. You know, they just want to expand it into a global empire of sorts. And therefore, it's long-term planning versus short-term planning that makes all the difference. And this long-term plan established almost since they got there, to me, just watching, 
I think I've become a little bit more romantic about Manchester City than I ever expected to based on the quality of their football. You know, seven titles in the last, what is it, 11 seasons now? You know, nine titles total in the Premier League. I mean, it's just, and there's the quality of the football. I know to some it's been, even to myself, it's seen as somewhat robotic, somewhat, um, you know, difficult to watch in seasons past. Now, I just marvel at the beauty. I love watching Manchester City play football and I love all of their stars. Everybody seems able and they've just got these great characters. And you mentioned Jack Grealish. The fact that Jack Grealish, that personality, that character can work in this locker room under a manager like Pep. And he's thrived this season and got better and better and better. It just is, it's a testament to the club and the manager. I, I find Jack Grealish genuinely fascinating. And, and Holland, too, we've talked enough about him this season, so we do not need to go on. But watching him roar with the trophy, a gent who, who chewed the haters, you know, who said that City, he made City worse, even though he was scoring goals to be completely and utterly bonkers. Didn't need a season to bed into the Premier League that so many did. Thierry Henry, Didier Drogba, both incredible greats. Didn't need that year. Didn't have to wait a season to bed into Guardiola. Uh, once KDB tuned into his frequency, City became unstoppable. Not even the loss of Zach Steffen could stop them. Just a speed bump. Um, here we are. Only four teams have ever done what City have done. Win three English titles in a row. Huddersfield Town in the 20s. Arsenal in the 30s. Liverpool in the 1980s. And Manchester United twice um, in the early part of the 2000s. And as a football team, on the field first, the football they play, the collective harmony, the idea of it, the domination, the mindset, the utter, the utter pulverising force. Manchester City under Pep Guardiola, they're an art form, right, David? Yeah, and just think about when Haaland reaches the levels of, I don't know, like Darwin Nunez. I mean, it's gonna be it's gonna be amazing to watch <laughs> when it gets that good. Um yeah, it's a um and we joke about it that Manchester City used to score the same goal again and again and again and again. Uh, goal three point one dash hyphen. The one where XO David Silva gets three. down to the edge of the box and just kind of does a deep ball pullback that's yeah. shocking and beautiful. And now they almost uh, seem to attempt to score different goals every single time they take the field. They're just going deep, deep into the playbook uh, for what they're attempting to do. Players, and it's a, it's a complex playbook. That yeah. is exactly, it is a, it's like a NFL quarterback playbook of, uh, of options. Um, and here's the issue, is that the dark side of that art form, because it is an art form, it's levels above the complexity, the subtlety, the ability to execute of everybody else, there's no doubt. Um, but, you know, this squad, this peerless, undentable squad, where even KDB being out, either with form or injury, doesn't impact the results. It almost knocks the jeopardy out of football. As we said, you know the result before kickoff, really. The only question is, Will Haaland score the opening goal? Will it be KDB or or Mares or, or Gundogan or Foden or DJ Greels or maybe maybe Tiny Bernardo Silva will do one of those incredible headers? It's almost like when you eat a great chocolate, like like a Cadbury's fruit and nut. Oh, I love as, them. As good as it tastes, though, Dave. Yeah. Take it from me. When you eat a whole family size bar yourself, <laughs> too much fruit and nut. Yeah, start to make you feel a bit sick. And I feel the same. City's football is like incredibly beautiful chocolate. Like a little of it is unbelievable, but a lot of it, you kind of just become numb to it. There was a moment yesterday, I don't know if you noticed this too, where they cut in the stands to Gareth Southgate, England manager, watching what was going on. And it must be so confusing to him sitting down watching Phil Foden play, who he'll always going to go and play on the left or the right. And Phil Foden comes in playing number 10, you know, occasionally taking the ball deep in his own, you know, center circle in order to go and propel the attack. John Stones, you know, who routinely played by Gareth Southgate, you know, center back, suddenly playing in central midfield and doing these things. It's almost, it's Pep is, is, is drawing diagrams that, that other managers could not imagine drawing with the same personnel. 
And that's just what makes him so unique. That is what makes this asymmetric warfare. And yes, perhaps there can be a little bit too much asymmetry for anybody at a certain point. It's difficult to even focus. Even Gundwan, who now we routinely will talk about, oh, Gundwan, one of the most valuable players, one of the stars. The fact is, six months ago, we didn't talk about Gundwan in that way. Gundwan has become like at the level of a KDB, at the level of a Haaland, uh, at the level of one of these, you know, great, great city players. And just what he does, he just, there's always another one of them coming out behind, like unveiling their mask and saying, aha, it is I. And I just love this about this team. That's fascinating because when you think about that award ceremony, the, the, the medal ceremony, apart from watching Pep blank the Premier League um, CEO as he went to get his medal, um, and a lot of the players have not quite sure whether to shake or not to shake his hand. Um, it was the Pep, the player he dwelled upon on that, you know, Howland he gave a huge hug to, Grills he gave a huge hug to, uh, but it was Lewis that he just made a point in just wrapping his arms around hugging him. 18 year old, the gentleman with with uh, played a lot this season, will no doubt play more. It's as if he was telling us, take whoever you want from this. I have more coming. I have more children. I've been, I've, you, you're mating Gunnosaurus and win. Wait till you see what I'm doing in my laboratory. We don't want to know, Pep, but we do need to talk about, we need to acknowledge this. And it honestly doesn't get acknowledged enough in the game. Just give me a minute. I'm sorry to, to talk. This is complex and I want to get this right. Uh, but there has been so much behind that perfection that does feel eerie. Um, a city stand accused of over 100 charges of the Premier League's financial rules, some of which include falsifying accounts um, over a long period on that journey from being a team who were a trophyless joke before the owner transformation to one that has won the title of five of the last six seasons, dynastic. You know, once Sheikh Mansour of the Abu Dhabi royal family took over the club and poured over two billion into the team, um, financial fair play was instituted in 2009 around the same time. It was designed to make sure that clubs could only roughly spend as much as they earn. Um, and City have long been accused of, of doing the opposite. Um, they constantly announce that they are somehow making more money from commercial sponsorship than any other team in the world. Um, and exposés, there was, there was the expose in the German newspaper, the, the Spiegel uh, revealed overinflated sponsor deals, sponsors who were connected to Abu Dhabi, like, like Etihad Airlines, which led the club almost to steroid its revenue so it could spend more. UEFA investigated found that City had overstated sponsor revenue. They banned City from European competition for two years. City took the ruling on appeal to CAS, the Court of Administration for Sports. And I'm sorry to go so deep into this, but I want to get this right and accurate and fair, because if I don't, um, then it looks unfair to Manchester City. But it's important, and this is not why we watch. We don't watch to talk about CAS, the Court for Arbitration for Sports. But they gave a verdict in favour of City. Ruling said City, at the same time, had failed to cooperate with authorities and that a number of the breaches had been time-barred, hadn't been considered because they'd been brought by UEFA too late. Essentially a loophole. City fans will tell you, we won that case, uh, but they didn't. Uh, but their team did keep on winning. And this February, in an unprecedented moment, which was talked a lot about at the time, but has kind of fallen away. Um, again, because we don't watch to discuss legal charges. They were hit with 115 charges by the very Premier League, which hands out the title, which they covet. And failure to report financial reports, sponsorship revenue, not giving full insight into player salaries from 2019 to 2018. We don't know how long this process is going to take. There's so many unknowns. City deny the charges. They push back. They've questioned the very legality of the process. Um, this is all very political. I think the playbook in politics right now is to drag everything out. The outcome could take years, could be fines, could be point deductions, could be, but won't be, I imagine, expulsion. Um, yet to be adjudicated. Pep said he feels condemned already. He very much plays that victim card as his team celebrate the title. It is a surreal situation, Dave, in which City are resplendent, peerless, powerful, um, but also standing charged in the dock. That's what we, we, we've got this historic football on the field um, as they try and get four titles in a row for the first time ever. 
there's also the possibility of fingers on the scale. How do we square this? Can we even square this? It's like the emotional and the rational and the legal. You know, it's interesting. You know, I never intended to read as much about financial fair play as I have in the last month. But I think what's interesting about financial fair play, and we criticize justifiably UEFA a lot, but I think one of the good things about financial fair play that UEFA have done, it's there not to necessarily punish teams like Manchester City, who have enormous amounts of wealth, but it's in order to protect smaller clubs across Europe, you know, less wealthy clubs from, in order to compete, spending so much money that they put themselves at risks of even survival. You've talked about that with Everton, uh, that in some ways, Everton, who haven't reached the the level of accusations of, of, of breach of financial fair play rules, but they have been referred to an independent commission. And they are no doubt breaking financial fair play rules or skirting financial fair play rules in order to survive and in order to compete. And so what happens when a team like Manchester City, who can certainly afford, they're not in danger of going out of business, um, but by doing it, it forces the entire European pyramid to overspend on, particularly on player wages, to, to, to overestimate or over... Um, over-impute um, sponsorship deals to give them justification for doing these things. And so it is so important, not so much for what happens at Manchester City, but it's important for what happens in the lower reaches of each European Premier League or the lower reaches of the entire pyramid system of leagues. And the amount of money being lost to, you know, by owners means that you know, we are starting to see clubs throughout Europe go out of business and never return. And that is terrible for the communities which they serve. And by the way, I do need to disclose, yes, Everton have been charged. I am fully aware uh, for their own malfeasance in financial fair play. I think they've done ridiculous things and I have no doubt that they also uh, will be punished. But in terms of Manchester City, this dominance, I've never seen the like. Never see, you know, other clubs have been dominant, but never in this era of such cutthroat competition and never so clinically. This is incredible. City have only felt the chance of defeat for 10 minutes. It's incredible. There's 10 minutes down the final third of the season. Um, ultimately, something which raises questions about the very competitive health of the Premier League that we watch um, addictively week in, week out. And we'll leave uh, the last word to two comments, one from... Our friend, my great mate, um, John Green, who tweeted, I mean, I guess congrats to City on achieving the impossible dream, winning three consecutive Premier League titles simply by turning carbon emissions into sporting success, thereby creating the most obvious possible metaphor for our shared 21st century predicament. Um, and Jeffrey P at Cranny Tran tweeted us, congratulating Manchester City. Is like congratulating a billionaire's kid for having a nice house. Mm, not sure John Green wants to see everywhere where his Liverpool owners have invested their money and made their fortunes, but point taken. Yeah, okay. well, so, yeah, and Hank Green, while we're on that subject, we wish you health, happiness, strength. Okay, now to the battle for the rest of the top four, starting with Bournemouth nil, Manchester United won. United stroll down to a sun-drenched South Coast clad in their finest vault and earn a 1-0 win over the Cherries in a ho-hum game decided by a moment of Brazilian genius in the form of a ninth-minute swivelling first-time Casemiro volley. Just a stunning piece of artistry. One that means United need just one point from their final two games against Chelsea and Fulham to return to the Champions League under Eric Ten Hag. <laughs> David Brooks made his first start for Bournemouth in 598 long days after recovering from stage two Hodgkin lymphoma. It was incredible to witness. What a human being. What strength. What a wonderful club uh, Bournemouth are. Godspeed to them and their fans. Uh, almost as incredible. Casemiro's feat of human physical wonder in the United team that, again, like Marcus Rashford out with illness, Casemiro, that human cube, clearly spent the week reading Ilkay Gundogan's big book of, believe it or not, physical feats of torso contortionism. Eriksen dinked one over the Bournemouth bat line, took a slight deflection on the way, but Casemiro was locked on it, spun upon it as if he'd been expecting it, span, watched, swiveled, slapped, 
Really an improvised stunning bicycle swivel situation into the roof of the net. It was it was brilliant, David. Yes, I think Arsenal are going to be a team who think they're going to come back and be way stronger next year. You speak to Man United fans and they look at their own squad, they look at their own team, they look at their own spending power in the off-season and they're thinking they can get closer to their crosstown rivals next season. Yeah, a couple more players like Casemiro, that ability, that mentality, and wow, fuse out with... Eric Ten Hag, I admire that man. His leadership, his tactical acumen, his man management, so bloody much. But Casemiro, can we just say, so dense. He's like a Brazilian refrigerator <laughs> with legs. To see him, to see him do a Gundawan, you know, it's akin to watching a battleship have the jet ski turning radius. I, 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 it was just an amazing human bloody moment. It's like watching one of those magic pet Instagram reels, but we should know David De Gea, smart when called upon, much derided down the stretch. He's only gone and locked down his second Premier League golden glove of his career, 17th clean sheet of the season. Um, and a magical day, um, really for United, a relief, an outbreath. Ten Hag's late season wobble, those fears seem to be banished, fret no more, one point from two games, Champions League football back. Really, after failing to win their last three on the road, huge, huge win for ETH. Now, because United won that match, it meant Liverpool had to get at least a draw at home against Aston Villa to keep any semblance of Champions League hope alive. And that looked very much in jeopardy, thanks to a really well-taken Jacob Ramsey goal in the 27th minute. But after entering the game as a substitute, making his final appearance at Anfield, a player who is a hero of this show, the one and only Roberto Firmino did what he has done so many times before and scores a vital goal at the death, <laughs> latching onto a Mo Salah ball to make it 1-1 and give Liverpool a glimmer of Champions League hope. All hail yeah. King Bobby Chompers. Jurgen Klopp, watching from the stands, begins his two-match ban for questioning the integrity of Premier League referee Paul Tierney. Remember during that bonkers hamstring pulling climax to the 4-3 Tottenham game? He and a packed Anfield looked on at Liverpool's attempt to wedding crash that top four. Seven-game win tear, but it was Emery's reborn villa. Immense in the sun. Liverpool had a reprieve first when Ollie Watkins kissed the Canate given penalty before sending it wide. But a failure to hold out, you know, they couldn't. The repeated barrage almost from Villa led to Douglas Ruiz dispatching a stunning arc of a ball. Jacob Ramsey swept it in emphatically. Incredible way to mark a 100th game for Villa at the tender age of just 21. Still flies under the radar, that gent. Q Villa fans marvelling at their organised bat line, held Liverpool at bay comfortably. And the away end started the saying, I love this, Davo. If it wasn't for Gerrard, we'd be top. <laughs> and Villa, Villa did look comfortable in the face of Liverpool's response until three substitutes changed the energy in the 72nd minute two great servants Bobby Firmino James Milner both leaving entered the fray for the last time at Anfield along with Timmy Cass and Villa started the sag hang on led by Emmy Martinez proceeded to get more bookings for time wasting than shots on goal the entire game for time wasting yellow cards you almost have to admire that but 89th minute Mo Salah caressed an exquisite arc of a cross flicked with derisive beauty the outside of his boot Bobby Firmino read his mind this is the beauty of team sport, right, Davo? One man born in Nagreg, Egypt, the other born in Alagoas on the east coast of Brazil, both bonded in that moment. Mind meld. It's stunning. Bobby had almost begun his run before the ball had even been thought of being passed. That's amazing. That's amazing. I mean, yeah, I mean, what a uh, what a mindset to be playing this well when he knows that he's leaving, he knows that he's going. It's his farewell tour. Um, and just a fantastic, you know, I would say uh, example A, Roberto Firmino goal. Yeah, it was incredible. It was a signature. I mean, two feet in the air um, as he stabbed it home and then got absolutely levelled. Um, no smiles, no uh, joy. This was just business to attend to, an attempt to get a, a late, late winner. Emotions repressed. He simply dropped to his knees in prayer. Final goal at Anfield for, for this charming man. Big Verge offered this tribute by unleashing Firmino's signature Kung Fu goal celebration right over his head. And Liverpool proved for a winner, but not to be. Bonkers finish means the Reds stay fifth. Three points off Newcastle United and Manchester United. Um, yeah, oof. Unai Emery's side, we've got to say, missed the chance to leapfrog Brighton into six. 
Um, they can still make Europe too. Big, big love to them. We've talked a lot about admiration. Incredible job Unai Emery's done. Legacy changing for him. But the scenes that will be remembered from this game, for me now, coming back onto the field after the game, sobbed his way around Anfield. The place resounded one last time to the sound of C. Si Senor, signed every last signature, shook every hand, soaked up every last memory of the day and the previous 360 appearances and 100 night goals at Liverpool. Um, but you kind of got the sense as he walked around, it was more than the partnerships, more than the friendships, more than the lessons learned, more than the trophies, incredible trophies. Just, just watching him go from beaming to the verge of tears in milliseconds. It was humanly beautiful as the fans stayed forever, their chants echoing in the background. Yeah, no, it was beautiful. It's hard not to be emotional about sport. I found myself on the edge of tears several times this weekend, the culmination being Michael Block's performance at the PGA, but this was one of them. Uh, I must admit, I was I got a little bit emotional during uh, City's title win as well. Um, it just is wonderful moments like this, human moments in sports. He's the ultimate court jester turned people's prince, a cult hero. He's a lethal winning weirdo. And I mean that in the most wonderful way. You know, I've talked a lot about him. I talked about him on WGFOP on Friday. So you can gain my, my, my sense there of this man who played the game with this surreal, almost a dada spirit, absurdist. Um, you know, appreciated the life-affirming values of a no-look goal, uh, but also channeled the naive joy we all experience as kids playing this game and took it all the way to the elite level. Played as if he knew how transcendent football can be and how stupid it all is in equal measure. Um, we're going to release a video that John Green, my good friend, has, um, has recorded a tribute to really, I think, one of his favourite players all time. We'll release it this week. I'll just say, see, si, senor. Beautiful. And Aston Villa, Rog, 17th in the league when Steven Gerrard was uh, let go and Unai Emery came in. Here they are competing for a place in Europe at the end of the season. Another team who are going to have legitimate top four aspirations next season. Tottenham 1, Brentford 3. Ryan Mason's graduate thesis looking more and more like he bought it online after Spurs capitulate in their final home game of the season despite an eighth-minute Harry Kane goal. A brace from Cameroonian King Leonidas, Brian Mbomo, and a third from that Congolese king of calm, Johan Wiesa, cap an impressive win for a Bees team that know they will finish inside the top half of the table. Spurs, meanwhile, Rog, a real mess as they limp towards the finish line of the Premier League season. God, it really is a mess. The football director, the lack of manager, um, Harry Kane, so many uh, just question marks around, well, everything. Led his team out at home, possibly the last time in a Spurs shirt. Tottenham unfilled a mural of him outside the stadium. GFOP at JK461 tweeted us, no Champions League next season, but maybe this big painting of you will get you to stay. Um, Kane's Tottenham, two wins in their last nine, limp into the end of the season. This Spurs dream of modern stadium-propelled glory, really in the crapper right now, just a malaise, sense of lost direction. Um, Harry Kane did what he does, which is why the thousand of fans go to watch. Free kick, dead centre, quick roll back from Kulu. Harry Kane just picked the top corner, lashed at home. Goal number 30. He scored in 25 different Premier League games this season, which is a record. No one's done it. Tenth goal in London derbies. No player's done that. I feel like every goal, I've said this for him, is some record, some 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 uh, milestone of note. Um, and it felt for a second that Ryan Mason is a football genius, but a half-time change for Brentford. Dam's guard on. Suddenly Brentford, so much faster than Spurs back for this Brentford without Ivan Tony until January uh, meant to be their own everything starting his eight month ban for over 200 charges of gambling or, or doing the thing the sponsor on Brentford shirt encourages you to do in, in the second half very first shot on goal Wiesa found on Buemo. Um, he lashed home so smartly. Jen, who really seems to thrive when no longer second fiddle eighth of the season soon get worse for Tottenham um, by the way, those words should be the official name for Spurs this season. <laughs> 12 minutes later, and Bumo again, charging down the left somehow. A cute angle, incredible finish. Also sloppy defending AF. GFOP at Tim Rance tweeted, wonder if Tony had Bumo to score two goals plus 5,000. Late on though, even though he was on a hat trick, he fed Wiesa for the knifer. First time, Brentford win away at Spurs, can still finish in the top six. Man City await Super Bs. Brentford, 
I think that we're within a point of Spurs now. Could St. Totteringham's Day Tottenham for the first time since 1947? Credible truth that tiny Brentford have now beaten each of the traditional big six since they came up last season. But Davo, Spurs, commentator said, a club that seemed to be going in the right direction, somehow gone off the rails. There were boos at the final whistle. European football prospects and certain. What do you think Harry Kane felt? He came back on the field, black balloons with Levy out floated around the, the, the turf as he walked around with his family, his wife, his three kids, as many managers as Spurs have had in a very dour season. Just misery, pain, Sisyphus Football Club. You know, just the Spurs fans clapping him on the verge of tears. Big, sad Kendall Roy energy in, in the stadium. What do you think? What do you think? He was feeling his 28 goals. You can make actually the case, as many commentators have, that his 28 goals were more impressive a feat than Haaland's 36 um, because of the context, the squads, the quality of, of the assists he's been getting. What do you think went through his head as he waved possibly one last time at the fans? What is... Oh, are you talking about Harry Kane or Daniel Levy? What is Daniel <laughs> Levy thinking would be like one of the great... I mean, it would have been it would be one of the shortest books of all time because nobody knows. Rather than Kendall Roy energy, I think it's like Roman Roy energy at the end of last oh. night's episode. I mean, for Harry Kane, um, you know, I, it's tough to it's tough to think of a comparison of a of a player who continues as everything has fallen apart around him at Tottenham this season. A player who has continued to play so well. A player who's continued to score so many great goals. It's almost like his setting is set to whatever it's set to, no matter what's going on around him. He is the consummate elite professional footballer in that respect. But, you know, those, you know, Antonio Conte's words must be just just swarming around his head. That is he ever going to achieve what he no doubt wants to achieve as an elite professional footballer in that environment. It's hard to think that the answer is yes. As I watched him, I just imagine a great REO Speedwagon classic, just him humming it as he was with his kids, you know, I can't fight this feeling anymore. He probably wouldn't sing it like that. That's more like the Greek owner of... Um, of Nottingham Forest would sing it that beautifully. But, you know, I've forgotten what I started fighting for. Time to bring that ship back to the shore. Throw away the oars forever. Oh, Tottenham without Harry Kate. I'm not even going to go there, Spurs fans. Brighton 3, Southampton 1. The Seagulls secure European football in this dream season, swatting aside their South Coast rivals thanks to a first half double from Irish Erling Ireland. Evan Ferguson, always oh, a one to watch. The Saints pulled one back and at one point even looked to have levelled via Theo Walcott, but the equaliser was varred off. Pascal Gross added a third, and the Seagulls are taking flight for the continent next season. It's Just a wonderful Premier League story. First time ever in their history. Right, and look at their history. There's been some true darkness. I mean, recent, just near bankruptcies, evictions from their own stadium, wallowing in the lowest levels of English football. In an era of billionaire fueled 11s, this side, constructed via immensely intelligent investment and, and strategy and data analysis, really proof that romance, that hope can still burn bright in football. I admire them so greatly. We've got to say for Southampton, already relegated, significant news of the weekend that Russell Martin of Swansea reportedly going to be their next manager, fourth permanent manager since the end of last season. A sign they want to move towards a possession style, away from that Red Bull model of, of Ralph Hassenhuttle. And talking of managers, I'm interviewing Brighton's Roberto De Zerbi tomorrow. And I can't wait, due to me, to be clear, is manager of the year for what he's done. Um, and the fact he's done it all while looking like like a minor recurring character in The Sopranos, like like a guy who Meadow runs into at a club when she's <laughs> underage and doesn't want him to tell her dad makes it all the more amazing. Fulham 2, Crystal Palace 2, a London derby with summertime good vibes as both teams are solidly mid-table and exempt from the stress of finals. Palace took the lead via Odson Edouard, only for the cuddly cottagers to go in front, thanks to an Alexander Mitrovic brace. But an 83rd minute Joel Ward equaliser sees things end, honours even, and Roy can head home to iron that speedo for the Maldives. God, you think, but what now for Palace is the question. 
And the answer, their futures, almost certainly their past. Though Roy Hodgson was only brought in as a relegation firefighter, this man took them from the brink of the relegation zone to sweet, sweet mid-table. This team had scored 22 goals in 28 games before Roy arrived, proceeded to blast 17 in nine, which included five wins. Coax the best out of Elise and Aze. Uh, Roy is 76 years young. Starting to feel he will be back for one more season. It's almost like the Betty White of football. Yeah, brilliant interview uh, with him and owner Steve Parrish um, on Gary Neville's The Overlap on YouTube. Uh, Really enjoyed it. And Roy talking about offensively, he never gets credit for being an offensively minded coach, but it's the first thing he focuses on when he comes into a team. The easy thing to do is to focus on the defense. He wants to do the interesting thing, which is focus on getting shots and with all these incredible players. So yeah, I think Crystal Palace ending this season feeling better about themselves and better about their youthful mid-70s-year-old manager than they ever have before going into another season. Okay, Rog, now to the relegation zone, the bad place zone, where two out of a possible three teams will see the guillotine drop on their Premier League hopes. But we learn a bit more this weekend. We're going to start with West Ham 3, Leeds 1, Big Sam led, relegation threatened Leeds United, jumped out, to a 1-0 lead after Texan shot put King Weston McKinney launched a throw-in the length of Little Elm right to Rodrigo. It got a side <laughs> spin on it, Rog. It's amazing throw-in. He lashed it home on the volley, but from there, as they've done so many times under so many managers, Leeds just folded, allowing goals from Danny Ings, Jared Bowen, and Manuel Lanzini. The proud Yorkshire outfit must now win on the final day of the Premier League season against Tottenham to have even a chance of survival. You don't hear a lot about major leagues soccer and the Leeds United States of America anymore. And it's dark, man. Sam Allardyce, third of his four-game cameo. Um, Leeds really, you realise he made a deal with the devil. I don't know if any of you have ever done business when your business is failing and you, you, you've had to do a deal with the Albanian mafia. But I'm watching it, that feels a bit like this. May or may not have done it myself. Um, but a busload of Leeds fans in their Sam Allardyce mask. Reveling in the London sun against West Ham. They were hoping for a hangover. This team had been on the lash since qualifying for the Europa Conference League final. Um, Hoping for a bit too much emotion. Declan Rice, farewell to this hero. Six years ago, he'd made his first West Ham senior debut. It was meant to be they didn't care. They had too much emotion. They were hungover. And Leeds opened brightly. And we seem to get behind West Ham. Will Bamford, one-man crusade to prove he could put last week's dismal penalty failure behind him. Um... Long throw, quarterback style from Weston McKinney, Yorkshire Dak Prescott, Rodrigo. Style. Yeah, I mean, David, uh, Rodrigo, got to say, timed, lashed at home just perfectly uh, on the rocket. Fabianski couldn't even flinch. 15th goal of the season for him. Shirts off for Leeds fans all over the bloody stadium. But my God, that throw. Tell me that wasn't the moment of the season. Possibly all, one of the great all-time moments of the Premier League season. An assist with your hands. You know, it's so good, that throw-in. I honestly think it might lead to a rule change uh, where you can't put that side spin on the ball when you throw it. It is amazing, the power he gets. I went out into the back garden and actually tried to do it and saw how much further I could uh, throw the ball. And the truth is, not any further at all. But it's an amazing, amazing throw-in. And uh, tried it again a couple of other times in the game. And every single time, it looks dangerous. God, it felt so good. There was time for Bantz. Big Sam found five pounds on the floor. He's been looking for that for years. Um, every game he's managed, finally found it. Um, jokingly offered it to the match official. Bribe money, Bantz. Ended up pocketing it. Um, as if Leeds reported $3.5 million survival bonus was being paid early in instalments. Um, and the game really revolved around, were West Ham up for a fight? Because uh, Leeds have been so defensively suspect all bloody season. Um, and then Paqueta took the game over, sort of glide past all comers. Series of hammers corners led to a ball into the box from Bowen. And who was there to sweep it in? Beautiful Declan Rice. And I was like, on my couch, I was just like, Irons! Uh, not quite sure if that is actually how you do it or not, but I spent a lot of time this weekend. Thank you, West Ham. Thank you. Come on, you Irons. Second half, Leeds, so meagre. Robbie Earl called them pathetic uh, post-game. Not a single shot on target. Just fear kicking in. West Ham scored. At the end, they scored three times. Could honestly have done five or six. Bowen played through, finished smartly. Verba kept him on side, essentially by man-spreading. 
The goal went to VAR, but I don't think legally you can VAR a goal, can you, Davo, when West Ham have already officially unleashed the bubbles? Does that not make the goal final? Yeah, I need to read, uh, once again, refer you to the Premier League handbook. I haven't read all the details about the uh, the bubble exceptions, but that may well be true. Uh, GFOP at AC Milan Club DSM explained the bubbles are actually injected directly into the VAR booth, making mm. it impossible for the officials to see anything. It's incredible. That explains a lot. <laughs> um, God, it was just an agony. 74 goals leaked. By far the worst in the league for Leeds. Second row that they, they've scored first and then conceded a you know a will. Um to do this against West Ham who are on the on the lash until probably Saturday morning. I've got to tell you, Dave, I'm trying to be a big man. I'm trying not to experience Schadenfreude when I watch because I'm well aware it could well be, and it could be Leeds fans experiencing that next week. But my God, when West Ham scored, there was just this emotion that was intoxicating and sweet. Um, even though it was bile tinge filling my bloodstream in that one. West Ham just flipped the script. They you found European happiness. Moyes lost hurrah, but Leeds, 31 points for one game to play. Big Sam. I are you do you remember do you remember a Big Sam that proclaimed himself Pep and Arteta's equal? Yeah, it was uh, several se- oh no, it wasn't several seasons ago, it was last week. Um <laughs> it's yeah, it's amazing. I'm not sure how he's I'm sure he's still advancing that argument. Uh, I'm not sure that it um, is playing any better now. Maybe even a little worse. Okay, it was three games and one point a game. That post-match pie will have tasted of ashes and fury. But I've got to say this, Leeds, yes, you watch your team go with almost no fight um, in this game. You've got such loyal fans. They do deserve more than this chaotic club's given them down this stretch. Pray for Rodrigo's health. Uh, pray maybe for Bamford's health. Um, but you've got to know this, your final opponents of the season are lads, it's Tottenham. And I can think of few teams who will crumble quicker in that feral bear pit of Ellen Road. So make no mistake, all three relegation contenders have life and death ahead of them. Yeah, but they've got to win. Uh, okay, another game with implications at both ends of the table. It's going to be kicking off right around uh, the time that this pod is released. Newcastle versus Leicester with Leicester currently on 30 points with two games to go. They need a win in one of their last two to have any chance of survival. I feel like they're going to need to win in both of them, which brings us to one of the teams that they're chasing. Wolves won, Everton won. Perhaps you've heard of Everton, Rog. A draw that feels... It was a win, surely. It doesn't just feel like a win. It was a win. After trailing much of the game to a Huang He Chan rebound strike in the 99th minute with the Wolves of relegation baying at the gates, none other... (laughs) Then Colombian king of comedy, Yeri Mina, answers the call, sliding home an equaliser and rescuing a valuable point for your mob. What could be a valuable point? What could just be an inspirational point that they don't even need, but it makes them feel like winners, Rog. That's the important thing. It was was a momentum changer. Oh, we need it. Oh, we need it. We don't know how important it will be until, until this dread week is over. But I was... I went to this one trying to do something new. I rooted for something called, do you know this word, Dave, a catastrophe? No. Is it a so, catastrophe involving a ukulele? I, I wish it was. That, God, I'd love that. That would involve two of my greatest passions. <laughs> but a word that I've just found out about, it was created by Tolkien. Uh, it refers to a sudden turn of events in the story, which ensures that the protagonist does not meet some terrible, impending, very plausible doom. Oh, so a sort of a positive vendor punct. Yes, a you catastrophe. I love it. Um, that's what I was. I was just like, it's not great for football chants. You catastrophe. But that's what I needed all week. By the way, this is a weird one. You know, well-meaning GFOPs and a lot of friends. Danny Higginbottom often texts me positive crap. I'm always like, Danny, please stop. It never works. And I, I wrote in my newsletter how much I hate being told, you got this. Don't worry, you got this. You got this. Because I know that normally means Everton most definitely do not got this. Um, it's and so I funny say, you say this because I had to stop George. George wanted to text you after that. My son, George, wanted to text you after the game. I said, don't do it. Don't do it. It's not going to be read positively. I don't, don't even tell text me. you don't after tell Everton me. results anymore. We I just like leave it we got and save great, it for this, this we got pod. a great yeah George please I love you do not I mean a great le- raven from a GFOP Jeffrey Petsis who wrote me a beautiful note about how annoying it is to run a marathon hit a wall at mile 23 and then have hundreds of well-meaning spectators shout 
you got this, as he, he says, as you, quote, try and stave off cardiac arrest. And that's what I felt like watching this. Everton had gone three at the back because of injuries. I mean, it was awful. Patterson limped off. It was even worse. Michael Keane came on. He was like, if, if Harry Maguire and Phil Jones uh, spawned a bastard offspring, um, he came on. I felt sick. A must-win game. Everton hemmed Wolves in. Gay lost it. It was on the edge of the Wolves area, lost it. And even my 12-year-old Oz knew in that second, started screaming, foul him, foul him, as Adama Traore burns up the whole field. We knew. We'd seen this against Liverpool. We do not foul players on the break. Traore shot, Pickford saved, but Huang, whose name is actually Korean for completely unable to score against normal teams, slotted into the open net with a face that showed even he was shocked that he'd done a big boy goal. David, why does every crap player only score against us? Why, scientifically? Well, he did have quite a lot of time and space. That's uh, there was. If you're going to score a goal, you need that amount of time and space in order to do it. Yeah, it was a it was a bad moment, and uh, you know, Everton, it got worse. Who, though. Yeah, and it Everton, got worse. Who, who'd sort of been the dominant team in the game up until that point. Yes, because there's a Cossack behind every door, and then the worst I could fear came to pass. Everton credit them reacted with endeavour. With fight, no quality, obviously just kept coughing the ball up straight into Wolves' counter-attack plans. Then right at half-time, the darkest darkness that has ever darkened darkness. An innocuous challenge. DCL running onto a ball, suddenly slumped to the turf, shook his head. You could see the agony in his face. He knew. He knew then. He knew it was over. His race was run. Not a very long race, if we're being honest, Dave. And here's why I screamed at that moment. I was like, I would give that man my own groin if I could. I'd honestly, I would have cut in that moment. I would have cut my own groin. I don't need it. I would have cut my own groin. Now. I've got four kids. Don't need my groin no more. I would have medevaced it. I imagine like on helicopter, the medevacking it on ice to Wolverhampton and giving him the world's first groin transplant. David, here's what I need to know. Is that medically possible? Because... If it is medically possible, I imagine there would be other groins that would be ahead in the pecking order for most Everton fans to to take rather than your 50-year-old groin. Don't 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 neg my groin. your groin. Don't, yeah, don't don't there's be no negging groin. There'd be none of that groin Let's negging on put this. Put that podcast. on a t-shirt. Yeah, there'd be no groin dismissal here. You can't shame my groin. Um, but I do want to make clear, DCL, if you're listening, you take it, man. You take it. I need you. We need you. We need you. Second half, Everton tried, but man, it was sad trying. Wolves laughed. They derided. They mocked. We had no striker, no left back, no right back. Five central midfield. It's just impossible to watch. Wolves started the last shot after shot at us. Um, it was just whistling past our goal. Um, and I realised in that second half, it looked like we were going down with all hands. Everton are like Napoli, Davo, but like an upside down <laughs> Napoli. We're like a Napoli of darkness. We are the Napoli of losing. Uh, Ilopan would be an upside down uh, Napoli. Yeah, that's what we are. Ilopan. But we're worse shirts. Worse yeah. shirts. It was appallingly sad. We, you know, it really was. It felt like I was it stuck in Tracy Chapman's fast car, and I couldn't get the door unlocked. It was just. Mope, Holgate, put on to save our season, which is the equivalent, listeners, of if you're in a boat that's just drifting at sea, deciding, you know what, I'm going to drill a hole in the bottom of this boat. Um, game finished with us having Michael Keane as our striker, Wolves <laughs> housing us. They had nothing to play for, just laughing at us. That's all they had, and they did it. They, they had Ruben Neves. This was key. Took 12 minutes to leave, possibly last game for Wolves. Took 12 minutes to leave the field, hence the agony of injury time. Nine minutes added. Honestly, Everton was so poor, I'll admit this. I didn't even want nine minutes. I was like, <laughs> Give I was us like less. Please. Yes. I was like, yes. I was like, why would you just let us out of here with a 1 0 loss? You know, there's an, I'm going to say this, there's an Everton fan meme of official club merch with the Everton crest on and in big letters across the shirt, it just says, and I'm paraphrasing, it says, I effing hate my dad. And I spent the first five minutes of extra trying, trying to find out if it was real so I could put in a group order for my children. But, then it happened. I still don't know what happened, David. Can you describe objectively? What did you see? What did you see? What 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 happened? Well, I've got to be honest. I was watching this entire game. I'd given up hope at the end. 
I, I did feel that during injury time, Wolves were playing somewhat naively, you know, still racing forward, still allowing Everton space on the ball. And of all the people to end up on the end of, of that ball, I can't even think who that ball came from. But I'll tell you, I'll tell you, I'll tell you. I mean, this is what's so amazing. Wolves keeper Bentley have been so dodgy the whole game. Flailed under a cross, under pressure from Tarkovsky, who headed it back across David to Michael Bloody Keane. And in that moment, I've got to tell you, there are 7.888 billion people in the entire world. And I'm not going to lie, Michael Keane death would be in the bottom 7 billion of people <laughs> I'd want on the ball in that moment. Somehow he managed to think vaguely football and passed it to Yerry Mina. Yeah, that's right. Who slotted home, arguably the biggest goal of Everton's Premier League history since that last big one that DCL scored against Palace. Um, Yerald, King Yerald, the gent who disappeared, who, 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 who promised Everton fans when we blocked off the players in a disgusting fashion after we lost to Southampton in January. He, they were angry, surrounded his car. He got out to chat with them and he said, I will give my life for this club. And he did. I did this this hilarious character. It was like watching him move from Adam Sandler slapstick to suddenly like appearing in 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 a Coppola movie and getting an Oscar. It was this is the fluid front three, Davo, that's going to save us. Talk, Keen, Mina, Davo. Football like life makes a fool of all of us. Robert Plant's Wolves up there in heaven, looking down on us. Robert Plant, thank you for your mercy. Thank you for giving me happiness, my darkness, not being relegated. Since 1951, if we avoid relegation, maybe the closest we get to a trophy. I'm so tired. I'm so shattered. Um, at word, get uh, tweeted at my face um, at full time. My God, Roger, looks like you just came out of an s and dungeon. You didn't mean to wander in. That's how it feels. This is it. Everton now, a ghost ship of a team. No fullbacks, no striker. Home form miserable. I think it's third worst in the league. No preordained safety at all. So much darkness still to come. Deitch play 10 centre-backs and a keeper. Perfect Deitch ball. It's the only thing that's going to get us out of here. Dave, I do not know what I will do without Everton Football Club in my life. They're like air, water, Everton, polluted air, toxic water, Everton. Yeah. I mean, Everton are still going to be in your life, whatever happens, Rog, wherever they are. The amazing thing now, though, Everton sitting in 17th outside the relegation zone. I actually think that the most likely thing that's going to happen is all teams lose the remainder of their matches Bite your and, and Everton Bite and your Everton uh, Everton stay up with 33 points Bite. absolutely remarkable um off <laughs> here it is before we go a quick reminder about everything we've got happening at Men in Blazers this week powered by Bud Light easy to drink easy to enjoy tomorrow a new episode of Becky Sauber and Road to the Cup Wednesday a championship playoff pod special with Tim Ream presented by ESPN Plus and this weekend the season nine finale of the Men in Blazers TV show and Men in Blazers American Football Awards presented by Bud Light available on Peacock TV just search Men in Blazers on Peacock Rog can we get a toast to close us out? I want to raise this shot of Jägermeister, this bolt of human emotion in a shot glass to the two teams facing each other at Wembley in this Saturday's championship playoff with a place in the Premier League on the line worth up to $328 million. Winner gets that. Loser gets a swift kick in the down belows, belly full of broken dreams, turf back to the championship and the two teams competing are truly fantastic stories in their own right. Unexpected guests in equal measure. Luton Town, the Hatters, face up to Coventry, the Sky Blues. True wonder of this clash lies in the fact that five years ago, Coventry were playing Luton in League Two, the fourth tier, deep in the bowels of English football. And on Saturday, two clubs will walk out of Wembley to decide which will be the first to go from the top flight down to the fourth tier and back up again. <sighs> The two things can coexist. I mean, they, 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 they may end up playing the likes in Manchester City and Newcastle, these tiny teams. Luton's entire squad, uh, their wage bill's just $7.5 million, less than one of Manchester City substitutes cost. And Godspeed to both of these teams and their fans. They are coming from towns that have suffered in the decline of post-industrial Britain. Luton, historically the hat industry. Coventry, the car industry. City whose bleakness was captured in the 80s by that great ska band, The Specials, that song Ghost Town. More at stake for both 
chance in the global spotlight, economic regeneration for both the club, the towns, oh, to all of them, to both of you, wishing you glory, making memories that last forever. Courage. Absolutely. You can follow us on Twitter at Men in Blazers, at Embassy Davis, at Roger Bennett, on Instagram at Men in Blazers, at Embassy Davis, on Facebook, we're Men in Blazers, Twitch, twitch.tv forward slash Men in Blazers. We're on YouTube, where you can see a video version of our podcast, including this podcast, which we will release in full. And also our TikTok, look for it at Men in Blazers. You can always email us at meninblazers at gmail.com. Vendorpunk Rog. War pig! Was that a Rabona? I like snacks. Balls win, balls win. Take that, Gloria. Balls lose. To tweet. And Ricardo, rock on, mate. Kung Fu Fight in America. Love you, Dave. I love you, Roger. Oh, pray for Everton Football Club. Subscribe here for more Men in Blazers videos and courage. Yo, yo, yo. It's